Salaman Kumi, and the chair of the session is Bakar uh, Choudhury from the Gangs of Design Squad. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Martha, good afternoon. Actually, if I can start, can you hear that? Yep. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce <coughs> Salaman Kumi, uh, who will talk about the foreign policy of the new government going forward. Uh, Salama is currently a resident fellow of the Grand Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is also a columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, previously, he was a correspondent and Indonesia bureau chief for the Far Eastern Economic Review. I believe it was in that time that he wrote a book, My Friend, My Friend of the Fanatic, tra uh, Travels with a Radical Islamist, where uh, with with a radical Islamist who went through Indonesia starting at the site of the Bali Mountains in 2003. Is that? Is that a Bali Mountains? 2002, sorry, yes. Um, uh, and uh, as the columnist for the Wall Street Journal, uh, Salaman has written a series of very interesting uh, uh, op-eds on the on the Indian election, and so I hand over to him. Uh, please. Thanks very much for that kind of introduction, and uh, thank you, Amartya, and uh, University of British Columbia for having me. Uh, I have to sort of start with, uh, with, with, with a bit of a wine, which is that if you were to look at the, the topics today, um, both economic policy and cultural policy, I, I, I would have to say that compared to them, um, we know less about foreign policy, so I'm going to have a lot less to say that is interesting and definitive. So, on the one hand, we know less because there's very little about foreign policy in the media manifesto. Modi himself has no real foreign policy experience. He hasn't spoken much about foreign policy. But we also know less about the likely shape of the foreign policy team. So at this point, I just have to caveat all my comments uh, with the fact that this is speculative. I'm happy to speculate. But at this point, uh, we're, we're really we're reading the tea leaves to come to some sort of you know broad idea of what a foreign policy under the Modi dispensation would look like. My broad sense before I sort of launch into what it's going to be is uh, is that you're not going to see as dramatic change for another reason also, which is that in the foreign policy tends to be marked more by continuity than by change. Uh, there is, there are you know, constants such as all Indian governments who want to preserve the country's territorial integrity, all Indian governments seek a peaceful external environment that allows India to grow. Uh, no Indian government wants to see Asia dominated by a single power. All Indian governments seek a greater voice in global institutions for India, and all Indian governments seek to seek to preserve Indian strategic autonomy. Though the content of that. Uh, may vary, and perhaps we can get into this in the question and answer from government to government. There's also the fact that uh, much policy formulation rests with professional diplomats, Indian Foreign Service, Consul General over here, a very high, highly competent and highly trained uh, group of diplomats. It also means that, the, that politicians, generally speaking, have had less discretion um, and have, uh, that has also led to this great deal of consensus uh, in Indian foreign policy formulation regardless of who is in power. And finally, foreign policy is really not much of an issue in domestic politics. Uh, this may sort of, you know, this, 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 at, at the margins, this, 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 doesn't, this isn't true. So for example, uh, Sri Lanka is, a, is an issue in Tamil Nadu politics. Uh, sharing river waters is an issue for Western world politics. Uh, in parts of modern India, Pakistan is sort of an issue, but less and even that, less and less so. And thanks to the rise of cable news, uh, territorial incursions by the Chinese become a domestic issue. But these are all the exceptions. By and large, I would say that Indian politics is even more inward looking than American politics, and that's saying a lot. 
So with those caveats, the fact that this is what we know is speculative and imperfect, uh, and based largely on all these speeches and interviews, uh, I'm going to speak briefly, I won't be taking up my, all my 40 minutes because I'd like to have more time for Q&A. Uh, I'm going to speak about six things which I think will most likely mark the Modi foreign policy. Uh, the first is this idea of a strong India and a resurgent India that you see running through the speeches and documents. The second is that this is going to be a foreign policy that is that puts economics and trade at its very heart. The third is that India will likely face more towards Asia than the West, particularly in the early years of the Modi administration. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the key relationships with the United States, China, and Pakistan, and what uh, Robin Modi disposition could mean to those three. I'm going to talk about two interesting and special relationships very briefly, uh, Japan and Israel. And I'm going to talk about the final aspect with which is in terms of how it views the larger Indian diaspora. So let's start with the idea of, the, of, of a strong India. Now, when in, in the BJP's uh, manifesto, the very first line about foreign policy says that the BJP believes in a resurgent India, that, that a resurgent India must get its rightful place in the comity of nations and international institutions. In a similar vein, Modi has spoken about making this century India's century. The BJP says that, quote, in our neighborhood we will pursue friendly relations. However, where required, we will not hesitate from taking strong stand and steps. And finally, Modi has spoken clearly about modernizing the military and creating the defense management. So none of this is, again, sort of short and specific. What it all adds up to is this idea, which is also really expressed by Modi's own personality. In my, I just, I've just come back from three weeks in India covering the campaign. And the sense among many of his supporters, particularly among younger supporters, that India has been bullied too much. India has been bullied and humiliated for the past 10 years. And now India means a strong India. One of the things that came up over and over in my conversations with people in, in, in Uttar Pradesh and Delhi was the idea, which actually comes back to many of these speeches, that how could the Pakistanis come across the border and they had a couple of the news and ends up over So it all kind of adds up to the idea that now you have this you have this decisive leader, you have a strong leader, he's going to build India into this great power and uh, and make it more assertive. So if you will, you know, this is similar to Putin in Russia, similar at one point to SDY in Indonesia when he first came on the scene after the misgovernance of the mega years, similar in a sense to Taksin in Thailand. It all sort of adds up the idea of the strong leader. Its most obvious uh, manifestation is really on the economic side. That's where we see a lot of this. We see the same thing on the foreign policy side. The second big thing is that the Modi government's foreign policy is going to be based on economics. And this is not to say that this is a severe departure from the Mon Singh government that also to a large extent plays economics at the heart of its foreign policy. But I'd say that's even more so for Modi for a couple of reasons. Uh, the most obvious is that this has really been a campaign that he has run he is Prime Minister, he is about to be sworn in as Prime Minister, because he has convinced the people of India that he will turn around the economy. In a nutshell, this is his central promise. In rally after rally, he gave, gave me more than 400 speeches over the course of this campaign. Uh, I, I, I attended more than one of them. I've watched countless others on television. There was this one line that went on through all these rallies. Sabka Saad, Sabka about taking people along the path. And because that has been so central to this campaign, this is going to be the focus of his foreign policy also. In his manifesto, he talks about a, a 
about how India was not only a official guru of the world, but also a vibrant trading society. He has largely abandoned, actually, he said not largely, he has entirely abandoned the old protectionist rhetoric of groups like the Sardeshi government. So, in terms of the economic debate within the BJP, I would argue that the liberalizing and the modernizing of the FM only have decisively won, even though they may throw an odd bone here and there to the traditional traditional elements on things like and retail. And the consequences of that victory within the BJP of the economic modernizing is going to be felt acutely in Indian foreign policy that is focused on economic development. Part of this, of course, would be true of any government. Uh, if you look at India's trade to GDP ratio, it was 15% in 1990. I believe it's over 50% in 2012. So it's just the reality is that India does, India is integrated into the global economy. You can't go back to having a kind of Swadeshi protection's outlook. He, of course, has recognized that. He's from the Chief Minister of Tibra, one of the most major India's, India's most powerful looking states. Societies. This idea of, uh, of putting economics at the heart of foreign policy also dovetails with another major theme of his campaign, which is federalism. And here he has spoken about how the Gujarat government has partnerships with Japan and Canada through, his, through the Biden Gujarat Summit, and how we would encourage the rest of the country and other states in the country to also, be, to also reach out to countries across the world and buildings to build these partnerships, in fact, he wants every state to have a partner country. But again, the idea is it's, it's, it's very focused on, uh, on economics. Related to this is a foreign policy that is more East Asia facing. Uh, one of the things that's striking is that if you look at the if you look at Modi's speeches, when he refers to other countries, it's normally in economic terms, but he doesn't. You have none of the old rhetoric about you know, solidarity with the Afro-Asian nations, the modern movement, all of that stuff is gone. Uh, he compares India to Japan, to China. He says India should have learned from South Korea. Uh, the, the, the basis of comparison really in his, in his speeches has moved is East Asia. And so he's very much in the mold of, a, of a, uh, an East Asian development. Leader. And that's and, and and in terms of his visits, partly because of the uh, unfortunate events of 2002 and its repercussions in terms of his relationship with, with, with the West, he really hasn't had that much exposure. He's had exposure to the West in terms of Western companies and investors investing in Iran, but his visits have mostly been to East Asia. So he's been to China four times as chief minister. He's been to Japan twice. In Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, he mentions all of them in his speeches. Uh, Go Chok Tong, the former Prime Minister of Singapore, is his former advisor. He's met Abe twice. Uh, the Japanese are key investors in the Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor that passes to Gujarat. So, all in all, again, uh, if you were to add all this up, uh, I think that what you're seeing is a foreign policy that, at least when it starts out, is more comfortable. Looking towards East Asia, both in terms of both as an example of economic success, but also really the, the, the part of the world that was welcoming to Modi when the West effectively had left its time. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, relationships with Pakistan, China, and the United States. You know, in Pakistan, really the big question can be. There are two views, and I think they're both valid views. But the big question comes down to, can he do a mix in China? So, one set of people believe that it's really only a BJP leader who can effectively mend relations with China, with Pakistan. Because the BJP leader doesn't really need to do Pakistan relations. And the examples there, of course, are the, the, the Fajr Life Tree initiatives Bus Diplomacy of 1999, the Agra Summit of 2001, and the Islamabad Summit of 2004, about of how it was under 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 Vajpayee that the India-Pakistan relations have really uh, uh, received this, this this impetus. Um, the 
flip side of, to that argument really is that uh, Modi is no much And he does not come from the quote unquote moderate wing of BJP, he comes from the heartland wing. And he has taken a heartland position on terrorism. And so my own formulation on this is quite simple. I think that if there is peace, if there are no more dramatic terrorist attacks on India, I think his own instinct, because his foreign policy is going to be led by economics, is going to be to explore things like trade normalization with Pakistan. And there you have, in fact, if you want to take an optimistic view, quite a good sort of uh, alliance of circumstances where Nawaz Sharif, who is also from his country's conservative trade oriented party, act by business, uh, is in power in Pakistan, you have a pro business leader in power in India, you can imagine some kind of movement. And that's the optimistic view. Uh, the less optimistic, the, the pessimistic view is that there would be some kind of terrorist attack, there will be some kind of uh, uh, instability in India. For and the chances of a Modi government turning the other cheek, as the Amon Singh government did after the Mumbai attack in 2008, are very slim. I would argue that the, that the chances of any Indian government, even a UK3, turning the other cheek again would have been slim. But they would be slimmer still with the Modi government, given the fact that so much of his appeal is based on the strong leader who is not going to take this kind of thing down. Again on China, uh, you have, he has said contradictory things. Um, the summary of, of, of the Modi view on China would be this. He's going to be very sensitive to things like border incursions, but he's going to encourage deeper economic cooperation. Chinese have invested in Gujarat, and he has visited China, like as I said, he has, he has visited China four times. In 2009, he, in 2011, he met with, he was really given a, a red carpet treatment by the Chinese. He met with four members of the Politburo, and his visit was given, given the trappings just short of head of state. So he was really, he's been treated well by the Chinese. The Chinese have sort of spotted his potential early, they booed him. But at the same time, he's been very clear about uh, on the on the security side. So for example, during the campaign, while he was in Arunachal Pradesh, which is an Indian state that the Chinese claim as their territory, uh, he warned China to quote shed its mindset of expansionism. So what you have really in China is you, what, you, what you have in terms of Modi's policy towards China is is going to welcome the economic cooperation, but again. If have the kind of conversions that we that we saw last year. Uh, again, there's going to be much more pressure on him to act quickly and act decisively. So, depending on the posture that the Chinese themselves can take, uh, we will see how rocky or how calm the relations between will be. The United States relationship is the most is, is obviously the most tricky one. Um, as, as many of you know, Modi's visa to the United States was. His diplomatic visa was denied and his tourist visa was revoked in 2005. And this was really because of the 2002 Gujarat riots. Uh, in his speeches, to his credit, Modi has taken a statesman-like tone. Uh, he said, for example, that relations between the two countries cannot be determined or be even remotely influenced by incidents related to so he has taken this high road, he has refused to be baited. The question comes up and it has, has come up in virtually every interview that he's given. And he has consistently said that what happened in terms of the visa, that was a question of an individual. That does not affect the policy of the government of India. The government of India is interested in good relations with the United States. So he said all the right things. Um, however, you can't deny the fact that among his advisors and among his supporters, uh, there is a great deal of resentment. To put it simply, they feel that he has been unfairly treated. The freedom of religion law that was used to deny him his visa and revoke his tourist visa has never been used before or since. 
And so for, again, this is also, you know, you can argue both sides of it, but for a Modi supporter, the idea that somehow the most egregious violation of religious liberty on our planet occurs in Gujarat, is sort of ludicrous when you have every second Saudi Sheikh checking in to the United States every week. So they view that with resentment, and I met with one of his uh, senior advisors just, uh, just before I took the flight out from Delhi on Sunday. And he was telling me that there is a strong grassroots feeling among the rank and file that do not visit the United States. Do not give them that because they have humiliated him and he should not uh, be seen as too eager to make offenses. Uh, I don't view is that he that, that pragmatism is going to prevail. If you look at uh, Modi's record in Gujarat and just keep it uh, CEO of the firms that have been invested, he never once victimized American companies. American companies are as happy as Indian companies or companies from any other country. They speak about the investment climate being very friendly, that being less red tape, that the products are being quite cooperative and so on. And uh, there's one sort of interesting incident where uh, where the US ambassador at one point wanted to go and they wanted to go, apparently wanted to go and, and, and see him, but couldn't get to go see him because they were waiting for a, a dispute to be to go up all the way to the chief minister as it usually happens. But in this case, because it because the trial has run so well, the dispute was just resolved at that lower level, so you didn't even need any ambassador intervention. So by and large, uh, so so he has not discriminated against US companies at all. So I think on the economic side, there is actually cause for optimism. If he can get the Indian economy to start moving again, a lot of the problems in the US India relationship over the last two years have been related to economic issues. Um, that said, there isn't, they're not, the two sides do not start out with a great degree of war. And the conundrum is this that what the Americans need to do to reach out to Modi, in my view, is above all symbolic. This is not about bits and pieces of this policy or that policy. But what they need to do is to give him face. But the kind of face that they need to give him may be particularly difficult for a democratic president. I was something like a state general. Because even though the dominant view in Washington now is that obviously India is a very important U.S. must find a way to work with whoever is the Prime Minister of India, particularly the popularly elected Prime Minister with the greatest mandate since 1984. Uh, this doesn't change the fact that there are groups in the United States for whom this Modi remains an anathema, largely because of the United States investment too. So the United States relationship is going to be uh, interesting to watch. Uh, I think cooperation is going to continue, but there certainly isn't going to be a warm I'm going to touch upon these two, two more things quickly before winding up. Uh, in terms of special relationships, I'd say the two things to watch out, two countries to watch out for are Japan and Israel. I've already spoken about Japan, and here one of the things that's, that's particularly interesting are the affinities between Modi and Abe. Uh, Modi has met Abe twice. He met Abe the last time he was in Japan, so <coughs> Abe was not the Prime Minister of Japan, he was in the opposition. And the comparisons that come to mind are that these are, these are both cultural and nationalists. They both have placed economic revival at the heart of their political program. They both believe in strong militaries, and they both represent the Asian right in their own ways. And it's a kind of strange beast that uh, many in the West are extremely uncomfortable with because it doesn't have the same natural affinities that various rightist groupings have within the West, and obviously it doesn't have affinity with leftist groupings. Just as, just as Abe, for example, gets a lot of flack for Yasukuni, I would say that Modi is, is the, probably the first Indian Prime Minister since independence who's going to find a large section of the Western media and academia uh, 
fundamentally of course it can uh, pass on to that. So but then very, very interesting uh, affiliations, uh, affinities there between Audi and Abe. And I would imagine that if I had to bet today on the first country that he visited, it's certainly going to be central. And also for the economic reasons and his emphasis on building new cities and infrastructure, it just makes sense to me for many other reasons. This is not to say that Japan has not been in an, an important relationship for the current government, it has. It's an important relationship for India in any case, emphasizing the idea that there's continuity, but I'd say that there's going to be a special affinity with the former B. And the second is, is Israel. And here the, 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 the reasons are quite obvious. Uh, the BJP and Israel, particularly the group of Israel, the Israelis in general, uh, have you know, shared ideas on, the, on terrorism and its root causes. And again, this isn't a sharp change to the degree that Israel is one of India's most important uh, defense and security relationships. But the difference is this that the Modi administration is likely to take the relationship out of the closet. So over the past 10 years, there has not been a single head of state or head of government visit from Israel to India, and obviously not from India to Israel. Uh, we're likely to see that change. I would not be surprised if sometime during the Modi prime ministership, we have the prime minister of Israel as a guest. I would not be surprised if Modi, in fact, I would be surprised if Modi is not the first Indian Prime Minister to visit. So this is a very, very interesting possibility. But again, mostly in terms of symbolism, because the relationship has remained strong uh, under the UK in, in a more Subterranean way. Finally, just a few words on, on, the, on the diaspora before I uh, wrap up. The BJP manifesto talks about the NRIs and PIOs settled abroad as, quote, a vast reservoir to articulate the national interests and affairs globally. This resource will be harnessed for strengthening brand India, end quote. He also says that India shall remain a natural home for persecuted Hindus and they shall be welcome to seek refuge here. And he's spoken about how India will need to take special care of Indian origin people like the Tamil Muslims. Again, this comes down to something that is you know, we'll touched touch upon some of this in some ways. The idea of nationalism, there's, there's, a, there's more of a, 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 there's a blood element in the way we live in some of our traditionally uh, view this. Just yesterday in his acceptance speech to Parliament, it was quite a dramatic speech, I don't know how many of you watched this, to the BJP parliamentary parties. This is the first time Modi enters Parliament, you know, there's 282 BJP MPs over there, and he's giving them the exact acceptance speech. And obviously, it's a sort of hugely moving moment for his party and sort of led them, led, led, led them back to power from the wilderness, so to speak. And much of the speech was, you know, thanking Rabani and, and speaking of the old sort of stalwarts of the movement from five decades ago, like in the al party. But one of the things he talked about was the idea of the Indian diaspora and how when you that he, he, he spoke about the diaspora, these are our people. And look at our people, when our people go outside of India, they do so well as long as they're given an opportunity. We in India need to also start thinking in the same way to give our own people an opportunity. So it wasn't as though he was speaking about the diaspora as a policy point. But I think just in terms of, it was just, there's, there's a naturalness and there is a sort of, there's, there is a, there's a conception of who belongs, partly due to this sort of this idea of internationalism which has been spoken about, uh, which is a little bit different from the traditional idea. So I imagine that there will be stronger links or in some way, and of course some of the pioneering work such as the, OCI card and PIO card and those, those kinds of things. Some of that is in fact regarded under the large by this institution. So we can just need to see what Modi does. In particular because the, the Gujarati diaspora has been reasonably influential. They have raised resources. One of my friends on his campaign is a very interesting here, Gujarati who in London. They've been very 
very happy to sort of draw on diaspora resources. And if you look at the diaspora anecdotally, the only two parties that uh, Indians in the West have really kind of uh, stood behind and kind of got fired up about have been the BJP. There's no such thing as an overseas Indian Congress supporter unless it's their dad or something. It goes back to campaign, it just doesn't exist. But you do have lots of these, you know, young people who are fired up by the idea of kind of living in the, or to a lesser degree, but in favor of. I think that these parties sort of have a, have a fundamentally different relationship with the diaspora, and we are interested in how that translates into policy. So that kind of, you know, I hope that gives you, I know this is a little bit sketchy, but this is just all we have to go on at this stage. We don't know who his national security advisor will be, we don't know who the foreign minister will be. The old continuity has gone, British Mishra is no more, just one thing is not in the party. So our ability to extrapolate from NDA 1 to NDA 2 is quite limited. So I've only been able to give you a kind of broad sense of where I think this is likely to be headed. Um, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sadhana. It's very, very good, actually, uh, as, as one would expect from someone like you. Um, a few points just complementing you, really, I'm not sure, you know, and I can react, I'm not sure whether I should say unnecessary in the form of questions. Uh, like you, I also believe to you recently that um, this US India relationship will not be rocky, and, you know, he will make more than he will make good on his word in his interviews that. Parts could not be uh, uh, in the way in any form uh, uh, influencing the, the, the relations of the country. But you know, there's some disturbing signs on, on both sides, it seems. Uh, I don't know if you have to you have to that. Uh, uh, there have been a lot of postings actually uh, by Modi. Uh, thanking the world leaders, uh, very warm one for the Canadian Premier, uh, uh, for the uh, Chinese, for the Japanese and all, missing from the whole thing is any mention at all of President Obama. Uh, not a good sign. Um, I think it also felt like the way Obama himself has uh, opposed the flu outgoing and incoming prime ministers is that he it feels as though he was a lot warmer to the outgoing one than the incoming one, which again is not a good sign uh, on this side. Uh, at least I know of, you know, there is a fair bit of lobbying going on on the cabinet here, uh, therefore Modi is bad news for uh, both India and the United States and the US lady. I mean, not that the visa issue is any more an issue, uh, uh, de facto, uh, but, uh, or did you read it, but uh, nevertheless, the, you know, this whole thing that the US should not ease up on this. And at least in one case I know, a member of the Congress uh, who wanted to pass on it, the member who spoke to Modi, congratulated him on it all, but there was an advice given to or don't go too far out and you know, uh, making it a uh, overly warm statement. You know. So on both sides, there, there seems to be some summation. Uh, that's one set of things. Second, I'll be interested to know what you think will be so. Japan is very not obvious, uh, but, but other than those two, uh, which country you see may be the one who will visit next. So, is this going to be China or is this going to be the United States? And that's, 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 that's the point that I'm asking the one question. Um, and there's a couple of little points. Um, one, one of the things that what you've been saying was that, you know, the, 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 what are we doing with our external presidents? And today, the, uh, the, the, the foreign policy is all about foreign economic policy. It seems to me, to me, at least the signals in given, there be also some speculation that he might even move, uh, that this is the, the DGI 
trade, this is in the commerce ministry, to the external affairs. There is some, some issues raised. So it seems to me that this economic side is going to 